going to be 475. Jesus is all the world to me. We sing in the first, second, and last stanzas. Please be standing. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him I would fall. When I am sad to Him I go. No other one Hear me so when I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trial sore. I go to him for blessings and he gives them more and more. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest gold and grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He Missy, 
Uh, I'm sure you guys have noticed by now that we don't have a piano player today. Uh, her uh, rheumatoid arthritis is really, really uh, working overtime on her today, so she's not here. Uh, so pray for her. Um, actually, uh, and then the other two are both praise reports, actually. Kara, who uh, got saved about two weeks ago, uh, the granddaughter of Sandra and Phil, she's being baptized today. Uh, awesome. So that's amazing. She's being baptized there at her home church. So praise the Lord for that. And then also, I'm not sure how many people are aware, how many people they want to wear, but I'm about to tell everybody. Uh, Chris and Carmen are getting married this week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Getting married Friday. Yeah. That's right. <laughs>
to be treated by the children's choir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus loves me. 
Good morning and welcome to worship. I am Danny Pace, pastor here at Plano Baptist Church, uh, and I am blessed to be here with you. Uh, I am equally blessed that you would choose to be here with us. I know we have several visitors in the room. Thank you guys so much for choosing uh, to worship with us this morning. Make yourself at home. But whether you are here in person or attending online this morning, we are glad to have you. Uh, church, grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 16 this morning. Genesis chapter 16. The the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. Uh, you're probably sick and tired of hearing me say that every single week, but it's true. Uh, Genesis represents the birth of everything, of the universe, of the world, of mankind. It's the birth of sin. It's God's people. It's our faith. It's the birth of our future redemption. It's the story of the past. It's the story of today. It's the story of things yet to come. The story of things yet to come. This morning's message is entitled, Two Sons two paths, two sons, two paths. Genesis chapter 16. We're going to begin with verse 1 and we're going to go through to verse 16. Please join with me. And Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. And when she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong that I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think is best. But then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and to where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and every woman's hand will be against him, and he will live in hostility towards all of his brothers." She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. And so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son that she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Now, you know me. Uh, before we get into the weeds of this week's passage, uh, I want to recap where we left off. Last week, God spoke to Abram and reiterated the promise that he had made to him, that Abram would be the father of a great nation, that God would give his descendants the land that they were now on so that they could call it their own, that Abram would be blessed and that all people of the world would be blessed through him. And those promises would come to pass just as God foretold. There was just one problem in all of this. How was Abram supposed to be a father of a nation when he and Sarai had no children? How would that be possible? So Abram voiced these concerns to God, and in return, God doubled down on his promise. I love that. Abram and Sarai would have a son, and to seal the deal, God made a blood covenant with Abraham. Now, we learned some things about this really interesting covenantal ritual that took place in the Old Testament, this blood covenant. Usually, the two negotiating parties would walk between the portions of sacrifice at the end. It was a symbol of each party's binding obligation to the covenant, the seriousness of the covenant. But in chapter 15, we find that only God walks between the sacrifice asking nothing from Abraham in return. 
Our our takeaway was that God extends this same kind of open-ended covenant to all of us. Only the sacrifice is the sacrifice of His Son, of Jesus. Anyone who trusts and believes in Jesus will be saved. Uh, To borrow from last week, will be made righteous. Our inheritance, eternal life, our home, the kingdom of heaven. Don't forget that text that we read last week from Romans chapter 4 because it kind of ties everything together. In Romans chapter 4 we read, Yet he, Abram, didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him, Abram, alone, but also for us, to all whom God will credit righteous, for all of us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, for our salvation. That's good stuff, church. In the book of Romans, Paul joins everything together. He brings it all together. This passage in Genesis is about us. Now let's turn our attention to today's passage. Over the course of the last few weeks, we've been watching as Abram's faith continues to grow. He's learning to trust God, that God would provide for him, that God would protect him, that God would keep his promises to him. But we really haven't heard much about Sarai. Sure, she's figured into the story all along, and she's been pretty much a side character while Abram has been the focus. But today, in chapter 16, Sarai plays a pivotal role. In fact, she's going to speak for the first time. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Sarai speaks. And we're instantly aware that her journey has not been the same as Abram's. Where his faith has continued to grow, it seems that hers has not. How do we know that? Because there are two things she says there in verse 2. Two things. First of all, she says, The Lord has kept me from having children. Now, not only does this show that she's questioning the whole promise thing, but she's actually blaming God for their lack of children. It's his fault. He's keeping me from conceiving. And then she goes on. She says, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Sarah says, I will build a family. Sarai is done waiting for God to fulfill his promise. She's taking matters into her own hands, building a family herself, even if it takes another woman to do it. She's done waiting. So she hatches this plan that she would later come to regret, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, she has to convince Abram to go along with it. We're not given the details of what this conversation may have looked like, whether they fought over it, whether they didn't speak for days about it, amen, (laughs) or whether Abram simply just gave in quickly, but I can hear their voices. I can hear those words going back and forth, right? I'm telling you, Sarai, God told me that we would have a son, you and me. This isn't what he had in mind. I know it. Or perhaps you remember Abram. Egypt, Abram, do you? Do you remember what you put me through in Egypt? Now take that woman and give me a child. I deserve it. We do know one thing. We know who won the argument. (laughs) Abram at some point gives in. Look back at the tail end of verse 2. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. I actually like the way that the King James Version translates this, uh, the words that it uses. In the King James, it says, Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Rather than listen to the voice of God, Abram 
was persuaded by the voice of his wife. Genesis chapter 16, picking up with verse 3. And so after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Did you catch that? It had been ten years since they had entered the land of Canaan. A full decade since God had first spoke to Abram. A decade. And still, no child. Would you have waited? What about five years? What about five months? Would you have continued to wait on a promise that you were beginning to lose hope in? Or would you have taken matters into your own hands? I think we can all relate to that. We shouldn't be too hard on Sarai because we've all been there. We know the feeling. We take matters into our hands every single day when we get tired of waiting for God to provide or to show up or to do what we want. Of course, Sarai's impatience and her lack of faith didn't just affect her. Our sins never do. It also affected her husband and it affected poor Hagar. We don't know anything about Hagar really before this passage. Just that she's an Egyptian slave, probably an indentured maid servant. Not that that makes it any easier, but she probably wasn't a slave in the sense that we're familiar with here today in America. It's also likely that, that Sarai obtained Hagar's services during her time in Egypt when she was briefly the wife of Pharaoh. That was several weeks back, if you remember. Regardless, Sarai convinces Abram to marry Hagar and to have a child with her. A child that would be Sarai's to raise and to call her own. It wasn't an uncommon practice during these particular times, and it still happens today. Uh, the difference is that today, people willingly enter into surrogate negotiations, and it's done through science. Sarai had neither of those options. Neither of them. There is one way that this surrogacy resembled some today, and that is this. Emotions can run high when another woman is carrying your future baby. It happens all the time when a surrogate contract uh, goes through legal battles because one party decides they no longer want to go through with it. In this particular situation, just like back then, jealousy can rear its head. A sense of ownership can develop. It was no different for Hagar and for Sarai. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 4, it says, And when she, Hagar, knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. I'm sure that, that the issue began immediately once Sarai realized that Hagar conceived so right away. It meant that the problem resided with Sarai and not Abram. You can tell that Abram was never really in favor of this plan at all by the way that he responds to Sarai's demands. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do whatever you think is best. In other words, this is your doing. You take care of it. And she does. We're told that Sarai mistreats Hagar. Now we have no idea what that means or what it looked like. All we know is that it was bad enough that it made Hagar run. She fled. She fled someplace where no one would ever be able to find her. But God found her. God saw her. Genesis 16 verse 
7 through 11, it says this, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to shore. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. There are several references to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, and scholars believe that in some way or another, these are encounters with the Lord himself, perhaps even Jesus See, because the angel of the Lord, whenever he shows up, he speaks on behalf of God. But there are several places in the Old Testament where he not only speaks on behalf of God, he speaks in the first person as God. Which means that it's likely God himself has visited Hagar. This girl who didn't ask to be put in this situation. He sees her. He cares for her. He provides for her. And he offers to promise her the same thing that he has promised to Abram. Through Abram's seed, her son, Ishmael, God would build a nation. Now, it's not the nation that God had intended to give Abram. The covenantal promise would not pass through Ishmael. Instead, his people's future would be marked with hardship and struggle. And I don't believe that this is a curse by God in these verses. It's actually God just foretelling what his future would look like. We find it in verse 12. He will be a wild donkey of a man, stubborn. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility toward all of his brothers. This is the future for him. Hostility with his brothers. His brothers, of course, being Abram's other children, specifically Isaac. Isaac and all of those who had come through the child of promise, the nation of Israel, the Jews. Ishmael's descendants would give rise to the nomadic tribes of the Arabian desert, the future nation of Islam. Verse 12 would come to pass. The Jewish faith and therefore the Christian faith would forever be at odds with the Muslim faith. It is bore down in historical fact. But as you can see, Abram would indeed be the father of many nations. For his descendants would bring forth three faiths of people, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. At one time, these were the three most practiced faiths in all of the world. And so metaphorically speaking, three nations of people would call Abram father. Which takes us to chapter 17. For today, we were supposed to read chapter 16 and 17. If you don't have a reading guide, I invite you to grab one on the way out so you know what we're going to be going over on Sundays. But Genesis chapter 17, we're going to begin with verse 1. We're going to read through to verse 8, and then we're going to skip a little bit. But I'll, I'll tell you when to look for it. Verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me with faithfulness and be blameless. And then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. And I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. For generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants after you. I will be their God. Verse 15, 
God also said to Abraham, notice how that switch happens immediately within the chapter. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah and I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Notice that in that one quick take, Abraham himself is already calling her Sarah in obedience to the Lord. Verse 18, And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son. And will call him Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve rulers. And I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. And when he had finished speaking with Abraham, he went up from him. He went up from him. Seems to exist that God himself was present with Abraham. Abraham means father of multitudes. And Sarah, mother of nations. God reiterates his covenant once again. But this time God introduces a couple of caveats. Number one. We have the first mention of God asking anything in return. It's there in verse 1. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you. He asks Abraham to walk in faith and obedience. Why this sudden inclusion? Maybe it's in response to what happened back in Egypt. Maybe it's in response to this thing with Hagar that Abraham has more to learn. Or maybe it has something to do with what God is going to ask of Abraham in the future. We don't know, but God clearly asks for Abraham and his descendants to walk in faithfulness. I will be your God, he would say later. You will be my people. Number two, God asks Abraham to mark their covenant with two outward expressions. First, the changing of their names from Abram to Abraham, from Sarai to Sarah. But the other a branding in their own physical bodies. Something that would set Abraham and his descendants apart from all the other tribes. Circumcision. Now we're not going to talk about it because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but read chapter 17. You'll find that whole conversation between Abraham and God about circumcision. And in this way, Abraham became the father of many nations of multitudes of people. Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. And so are you. The covenant that God made with Abraham would pass on to Isaac and to his son after him. That promise would also rest upon his other son as well. Ishmael. You shall be the father of a nation. Two sons. Two paths. One would carry on that covenantal promise that would bring us the coming Messiah that all nations on earth would be blessed through Abraham. But I want you to see that God promised to watch over both of them. Just as he was watching over Abraham and Sarah just as he had watched over Hagar, just as he watches over you. Hagar said it best in chapter 16 when she said, you are the God who sees me. Do you know that he sees you? Like Hagar, there is nowhere that you can run or hide that is beyond his reach or eye. And just as God was faithful to this poor, young Egyptian slave girl, he will be faithful to you. I pray that you know that. 
I pray that you would know Him. That you would see Him for yourself. Hagar would go on to say in that same passage, I have now seen the one who sees me. Open your eyes. See the one who sees you. Who always has. As we stand and as we sing, church.